not far from home keep on coming And oh, as you run, what hindered love will only become part of the story. And oh, as you run, what hindered love will only become part of the story. And oh, as you run, what hindered love will only become part of the story. And oh, as you run.
Good morning. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Yes? Welcome. If you are a guest here today, we want to extend a warm welcome to you. If it is your first time here, we want to be able to connect with you. And you can do that by texting to in to 94000 the word BNAS guest. And when you do that, we'll be able to connect and um, get some information to you and learn a little bit more about you. We would love to do that. Also, here at BNAS, prayer is extremely important to us. And so we want to uh, invite you to submit a prayer request. How, let us know how we can pray for you. And you can do that by texting BNAS Praise, P R A Y S, Praise, to, in, to 94000. And we will be able to um, get that prayer request onto our prayer team, which is very active and powerful. So if you could do that, we would love to be able to engage with you on that. I am Pastor Mendy, and I have the awesome privilege of leading Family Life Ministries here at BNAS. We are so excited to launch the next step to our vision, and that is our Family Worship Nights. Our vision at Family Ministries is to equip parents to be spiritual leaders in their home, parents and grandparents. We have a lot of grandparents who are raising grandkids as their own. And so we want to be able to equip spiritually for them to lead in their home. And this is one of our opportunities to do that. And that's our family worship night that will be launched on October 28th. And we welcome everyone in our church family to join us in this. It'll be time of worship. We'll have a meal together. You can sign up for this event through our Church Center app. And you can also text the word B family, B-E family, to 94000, and we can get you registered that way as well. The vision here at, um, at, in our Family Life Ministries is powerful. We believe that when we are able to equip parents to be those spiritual leaders in the home, we're going to be able to create strong families. When we have strong families, we have a healthy and strong church. When we have a healthy and strong church, then we have a healthy and strong community that can make a difference in our culture. So we pray that you will engage with us in this opportunity And if you are interested in in helping us, we do need some people to bring support so that our parents who are normally serving um, on our B Kids team have the opportunity to participate in this worship experience together as a family. We will also be launching a mission experience this night on October 28th. So please don't miss this opportunity. Another opportunity, opportunity for you that I want to make sure that you have on your calendar is November 14th. That is a worship workshop. If you are the least bit curious about what might be happening in Pastor Mike's ministry and leadership, I encourage you to take part in this. If you have been part of the worship ministry in the past and you haven't re-engaged yet, join in on this. Talk to Pastor Mike or Uh, register through the Church Center app, or if you're already on the team, we would ask that you also engage in this opportunity. All right, I would like for Pastor Chris to come and join us now. Music. It's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, it was just for you. (laughs) Yeah, that's my walk-up song. (laughs) Oh, man, so this is one of my favorite parts of being a pastor is the walk-up music. No, not that. It's um, welcoming new members into our church fellowship, okay? So I don't know what other churches are doing. BNAS, during COVID, we're growing. We're growing. Yeah, we are. I just came out of the, uh, the family room over here uh, where families are gathering with their kids and worshiping the Lord together and learning together. 
Um, so as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to go back in there and worship with those guys. It is just awesome. God's spirit is all over the place. All over the place. I think the question comes down to, will we engage with that, right? You're going to have an opportunity to do that today. But I would love to welcome up our brand newest member candidate, so the Torney family. If I could have them come up, if I could have uh, uh, the Riffle family coming up. Let's see, who else? Pamela and John, come on up. Let's see, the Martin family, come on up. We got a bunch, we're going to fill up the platform here. Okay, if I didn't get all of your names, make sure I got everybody. I think I did. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Come on up. Is this a group or what? This is great. Man, oh man. All right, yeah, so come on up here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta be on the floor. This is nuts. This is awesome. All right, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some stuff to them, and then I'm gonna read some stuff to you, and so you'll know when to say, all you guys have to do is say two words when I tell you to, we will, okay? Just it's coming. It's a test. All right, here we go. All right, dear Brookings, Nazarene family, the privileges and blessings that we have in community together in the church of Jesus Christ are sacred and precious. There is in it such spiritual fellowship and care and counsel as cannot otherwise be known apart from the family of God. There is the godly care of pastors with the teaching of the word and the inspiration of corporate worship. And there is the commitment to service, accomplishing that which otherwise cannot be done. Today, we affirm corporately, again, the doctrines and practices of this church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin, that they need the work of forgiveness through Christ and the new birth by the Holy Spirit. And subsequent to this, there is the deeper work of sanctification as we become more and more into the image of Christ. We also believe that the Holy Spirit gives witness to the work of grace in each of our hearts. Do you heartily believe these truths? If so, answer, I do. Okay, I think I heard them all. All right. Desiring to unite with Brookings Church of the Nazarene, do you commit to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself as expressed by Jesus himself? If so, say, I will. All right. Do you commit to the mission and vision of Brookings Church of the Nazarene as we seek to be a community that helps people belong, believe, and become? And will you support the teaching of this local church and strive with God's help to grow in your understanding and practice of faith and devotion to Jesus Christ? And will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversations, and holy service through the giving of your resources, and by faithfully participating in the life and community of Brookings Church of the Nazarene? If so, say, I will. All right, so you guys, to the church, to the congregation, do you, the church family, commit to setting a godly example, okay, of devotion, humility, and community as we welcome these new families into Brookings Nazarene Fellowship? If so, say, we will. All right. Then, as pastor of Brookings Church of the Nazarene, I welcome you as members, and as I'm... Mendy, you want to pass those out as I'm... We have $100 bills in each of those. <laughs> so, I welcome you into the fellowship of this congregation. <laughs> And with all of its benefits and responsibilities, may the great head of the church bless and keep you and enable you to be faithful in all good works that your life and your witness may be effective in your own family as well as leading others to Jesus Christ. Welcome to our church. Give my hand. Yes, 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 yes. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much. You bet. So, so... All of these folks up here either graduated B and U in either the, the last session or the one prior to that. If you haven't been through B and U, Brookings Nazarene University, I highly, highly encourage you to do that. We're going to do another one here coming up just before the, the, the fall break or Christmas. If you haven't been through B and U, I, I would encourage you to get involved in that. Thank you, guys. Take it away. <laughs> Are you ready to worship? 
Yes, we have come into this place to worship. And just as a reminder, we have many ways for you to worship through giving. And one of those ways would be we have a, a giving box here in the back. We also have the opportunity through our website and also our church center app to be able to give electronically. And then you can always, as old school tradition, you can bring it by the church office anytime during our, our work week. So now, are you ready? Can you stand? And we will pray together. Let's come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house today. I pray that as we worship through giving, that you would bless the giver and you would extend the resources that you've given to us and we would just give back to you to grow your kingdom here in this local community and globally, Lord. Would you make your way known throughout the world? And we ask, Lord, that now as we come before you, that you would have your way in this place. We love you, Lord. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
you hit him, let your faith arise. Did you hope some? Our God is for us. He's brought us back to life. Did you hold us up? Hear the word of the Lord to us from John chapter 14, beginning with verse 23. It says this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my, my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. This is the word of the Lord. You were matchless in grace and mercy. There is nowhere we can hide from your love. You were steadfast, never failing. You were faithful. And all creation is in all of who you are. Comfort the sick and the broken you will comfort for every heart that mourns our king our savior forever and for eternity we will sing of all you've done and for eternity we will sing of all you've done. We sing, God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against. afraid you were with me and 
you lifted me up. You lifted me up. And where there was death, you brought life forth. And where there was fear, you brought courage. When I was afraid, you were. next song I really want you guys to just get into an attitude get into an atmosphere of worship here you know we don't prepare and practice and and rehearse to come up here and put on a show for you guys this isn't for entertainment we do what we do to lead you guys into an atmosphere of worship where lives can be changed Worship isn't something we do. It's not a song that we sing. It's not instruments that we play. Worship is a lifestyle. It's a way of life. It's what we do. Everything we do, every act can be worship if it's done to God. But I want you to change your your physical posture. When someone tries to give you a gift, if you just stand there with your hands in your pockets, you can't receive that gift. I'm telling you, God's got something for you. But you got to be willing. You got to be open to receive it. So our physical posture, when we open our arms, when we raise our hands, when we clap, when we engage in worship, we're receiving what God is wanting to bless us with. I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what that is individually. But God's got something for you this morning. Do you want to receive it? So I want you to join with me. Is God not worthy of our praise? Man, is God not worthy of our praise? God is worthy of praise. The Bible says that if we don't, even the rocks will cry out. And I'm telling you what, I don't want no rock taking my place. Amen. So let's worship this morning. We pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. 
it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only come on sing it with me you give life you are love you bring life
pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath. Give God some praise this morning.
Spirit, you are welcome in this place. God, you are here and you are moving. God, we see you moving in the lives of our people. We just we feel you here. And God, we long for your presence. Our hearts yearn for more of you more of your spirit, Lord, more of your presence, more of your power. God, and as much as you're moving, God, Satan is still fighting. Satan is attacking families and homes. So God, we pray right now against those attacks. God, that you would continue to move in the lives of our people, God, that they may stand firm against the attacks. God, that they would be be brought together, God, that they would be stronger together. God, our hearts long for revival. Our hearts long to see you working in a way that can't be contained These four walls won't be big enough. This room won't hold what you're doing. It trickles into our communities, into our county, throughout our state and into the nation. So God, I pray that through your infilling of the Holy Spirit, God, that we would work in your power that people would see you in us, God, and that we would continue to be your hands and your feet and the light into this community. But start here. Start with us. God, we pray that you would have your will and your way in this service, God. Everything that we say and do is to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Oh, wow. Um... You guys, you guys like to worship? We're, we, are, we are made to worship. God created us to worship him. So something that I want to give you a, a sneak preview on. Um, it's our job as uh, pastors and shepherds and overseers of this church uh, here at BNAS in leadership to make sure that our people have as many opportunities as possible to worship God. So starting in November, 
we're going we're gonna to roll something out called Worship Wednesdays. And so on, on, we're going to start with the first Wednesday of every month. Hey, if people love it, we'll do it some more. But we're going to start off with an atmosphere, and it's not a replacement for the weekend, okay? It's not that. It looks completely different, and it's focused on three fundamental things. One, to worship our God, to focus on the truth of God's Word, and to pray. And so, I encourage you that how, how uh, as you allow the presence of God into your life, and breakthroughs start to occur in your life, I know when that happens for me, I can't help but worship. I have to worship my God. He made us to worship Him. And so, so start in November, we just want to open a door to more corporate worship. Um, and I think that will help us with a sense of expectation. You're probably like, oh man, Chris, will you stop saying expectation? I've been saying it ad nauseum for like three months. But I say it not for your benefit, but so that I can remind myself, and maybe it does benefit you, that the more I expect God to move, I am preparing that ground in my spirit for God to move. It's like we're out there with a, a rake and a hoe and we're just tilling up the ground and that ground is our heart, right? And we're just, we're just plowing these rows so God can dump his seed, the seed of his truth, the seed of his presence. That's what worship does. In the Old Testament, worship, the Hebrew word is very associated with the word work. There's work involved. There's this preparation involved and with that comes a sense of expectation. God is going to move. I want God to plant seeds in my heart. I don't know about you, but I don't know it all. I, don't, I cannot physically comprehend the greatness of God. But the more I worship him, the more I'm drawn to him. And our hearts will be changed. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to get right into it here. I want you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> in our series, Breaking Through... We're going to be talking about the prayer of infilling. Now, I, I know, I don't think I'm going senile yet. I know I brought a water bottle up here, and it has disappeared. That's not my bottle. <laughs> so uh, so um, maybe, let's see. Roger, would you go to the fridge back in the kitchen? Because I'm feeling a, a thing here. Um, so we're going to look in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to also look in Colossians chapter 3. And then we're going to finish up in Ephesians 5. So we're going to be right, kind of camped out right there. And so I want you to go to Ephesians 3. We're going to start in verse 14. We're going to look at verses 14 through 19. This is a very focused prayer by Paul for the church. Ephesus was, um, a, a, uh, Paul had a very intense love for this church at Ephesus. But they had some issues going on. And I think we're going to find some parallels to what was happening in Ephesus as to what is happening in the church today. So listen to this prayer that Paul begins with in Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14. It says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches... Oh, thank, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Remember that. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is Paul's prayer of infilling. He's praying it for the church at Ephesus, and he's praying it for us today. This prayer is for us today. It's interesting in verse 14, 
it starts off exactly the same as verse 1 in Ephesians 3, where he says, for this reason. For this reason. Well, what's the reason? That's the first question I ask. What in the world is the reason? Well, Paul, all through chapter 3, is describing this issue that is going on. There's this issue of discord and division. And in, in Paul's context, it's discord and division between Jew and Gentile. This was a major, major separation. By the way, folks, this goes way beyond Republican or Democrat. Okay? This is a big deal. And Paul, God had laid a, a, a call on Paul's heart to bring the gospel not only to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. And there was this problem in the church because the Jews are seeing Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but they're wanting them to be just like Jewish people and obey everything that was in the Jewish law. And so it was creating this, this discord and division. It was division between nations, between families, between people. Even in their own hearts, there was division. And so Paul's ringing the bell. He is sounding an alarm here, warning people of what could happen. But he also brings good news with this. And so this morning, I'm ringing the bell. I'm sounding the alarm. I'm issuing a warning, but with good news. Paul, all through chapter 3, he keeps referring to this mystery of Christ. The mystery of the gospel. Well, what was the mystery? Well, he talks about it. What was once disintegrated because of division and discord and dissension is integrated. It's brought back together, Jew and Gentile. What was once, once discord has now become of one accord. What was once division is now becoming one vision. And through the one man, Jesus Christ, all are brought together. What was fragmented, what was apart, has been united. What's our context? What's our for this reason? Well, I will tell you right now. I have sensed this in my heart. I have seen it with my eyes. My spirit is responding to this. And, and there's an agreement with others that are praying in this church there is an all-out onslaught from the enemy against the families of this church, specifically against marriages, against, against families, trying to bring discord and dissension and fracture and, and, and disunity. And here's the thing that we have got to watch out for. If we do not respond with all of the resources of heaven we will believe the lies of Satan and fall victim. This is our reason. So today, this morning, in your spirit, and if you even want to do it physically, <coughs> we're drawing a line in the sand. We're drawing a line. We're saying, Satan, no more. You do not have a claim on this place. You do not have a claim on my family. You do not have a claim on my life. No matter what you say, no matter what weapon you try to form against me, it will not prosper. Draw the line. Sound the alarm. Say no more. Here's what we do in place of that. See, here's the, here's the amazing part about being in fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's not only just drawing a line and saying no more. It's saying, you know what we will do? we will get on our knees and we will be a people who are humble and repentant of heart. I am convinced, you guys, I'm convinced it's biblically true. Revival comes when the people cry out to God. They, revival comes when we humble ourselves, broken and contrite, number ourselves among the transgressors and say, God, I repent. Now, I know I talked about this two weeks ago, but I can't get it off my mind. And it won't come out of my heart. And it's all tied to one thing. Here's the question. What are you filled with? We're going to come back to that question at the end of the message. What are you filled with? 
So today my prayer is that we would open our hearts to the fullness of God. The fullness of God and we would no longer accept the emptiness that the world brings. So what is the prayer of infilling? Well, Paul, he gives it to us in, in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. But in summary, this, this prayer of, of fullness, this prayer of infilling, first it starts off that with by faith, through prayer, I am asking the Lord for his fullness. Okay. <clears throat> if we could just stop being so assumptive about our faith, that's like, well, I come to church. I have, you know, I think I've got the right translation. Oh, yeah, I got that. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I belong to a, a, a B group, and I, and, you know, I just, um, I have good friends at the church and all of these things, and, and we get into this assumptive thought pattern that, that God will just make everything beautiful and smooth and rosy, and it's awesome, and, you know, jelly beans and Skittles and butterflies and ah, and we just assume as I look in scripture time and time again Jesus says this ask me anything ask the Lord ask me there's this action that we need to take if we want to experience the fullness of God we need to ask him we need to take that step of asking. So by faith, through prayer, it's asking the Lord for his fullness. Secondly, by faith, through prayer, watch out, it's coming to full surrender of my right to be right. Do you hear me? Fully surrendering to the fact that I'm giving over to God my right to be right. This is putting pride to death. This is nailing pride to the cross. If we want to experience the fullness of the presence of God in our lives, we've got to surrender our right to be right. Yeah, but, Pastor, you don't understand. I mean, I know things. I read books. I know stuff. I mean, I, I watch the Internet. Man, I know things. I know what's going on. Would you stop just trying to prove yourself to be right and accept for the first time maybe in, in your life to say, God, it is your fullness and nothing else. Nothing else. And then third part of this prayer of infilling is by faith through prayer, declaring to Jesus Christ that you are in alignment with his power and authority. See, this is where we really start to stray onto a different set of tracks. And, and we... we, we uh, and I say this because I've done it. Oh my goodness, I've done this. Where I, I agree with Jesus to a point. To a certain part of my life, I'll be aligned with him. But when, when, when the Holy Spirit starts meddling and starts messing with some of my, uh, you know, my preferences and my, um, you know, some of the things I'm really comfortable with, then I'm, I, I don't want to be aligned. I'll be aligned with you, Lord, for this part of my life. But, you know, I've got these other things. I can handle them. I got it. I'm good. Fullness means I am in full alignment with his authority and power. And here's, here's the blessing that we miss out on. That authority and power that he has to give to us makes things change. Things happen. Transformation occurs. So it's being in alignment with his authority and his power. So these are some things, I'm, I'm, if you can write this down, this would be really good. What does the prayer of infilling bring? What does it bring? If I'm going to ask God, if I'm going to ask the Lord for the fullness of his presence, if I'm going to surrender my right to be right, and if I'm going to be in alignment with his power and authority, well, what does that bring? It's kind of that question. Well, what's in it for me? Well, let's see what God's word says. Let's go back to Ephesians 3. Verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, 
he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. But listen to this part in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What does the prayer of infilling do? It brings a change of ownership. This is about making Christ resident in your heart. His address is your heart. This isn't Jesus swinging by for a visit. This isn't just a nice casual knock on my front door. Oh, Jesus is here. Let, let's get him a nice cup of iced tea, you know, or let's do something. Let's have a little visit. John 14, 23, Jesus says this, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will, listen to this, come and make our home with each of them. So, so Jesus is wanting to move into our hearts. It's a change of ownership. The title deed to my life changes names. It's not my house anymore. It's not my heart anymore. Jesus is, is moving in and taking up residence in my life. And here's where the struggle is with this. Our sin nature really resists this. Because we're, no, no. God, there's got to be something I can claim as my own. Some, give me something, God. Can't I just be the boss of something? And we get it so backwards. We think that control is freedom. We think that, that owning our own stuff and taking care of our own deal as we journey with Jesus, that, that is, that's the way to go, that that's freedom, that that's where grace and peace and blessing comes from, when in fact it's opposite. The entire kingdom of God is backwards, by the way. Jesus says, the more that you let go, the more I give. We're like, that's so opposite. No, God, I got to grab it up. I got to take it. I got to get it. Get, give it to me. Let it go. Because when we let go, and we let go of ownership of our lives, the residency of the Holy Spirit begins to change you like has never been experienced before. It's a change of ownership. On our own, with our own strength, that ownership change cannot happen. We will fall on our face every time. Part of asking for the fullness of God is asking, God, would you give me the spiritual power? Because physical power doesn't cut it. I need spiritual power for this ownership change to happen. I don't want the title of my life anymore. God, you own me. You take over. Your address is going above the door of my heart. The prayer of infilling brings a change of ownership. It also brings a solid foundation. Look what it says here in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established, maybe your translation might say rooted and grounded in love, may have power together with all the saints. This solid foundation comes. We are rooted and grounded in love. Our foundation is love. See, we, we get this twisted idea about how the love of God works. We only get God's love if we're good. We only experience the benefits and the blessings of God's love as long as we stay in line. That is categorically unbiblical. God loved us, according to uh, Romans 5, 4, God loved us and died for us, even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. That should be an amen. I mean, think about it. The love of God is made manifest to us even when we were a stinking, rotten sinner. Totally undeserving of love. And here's Paul, part of his prayer, this prayer of infilling, is that we would be rooted and grounded and established in the love of God. And I, and I love how this, um, this part about the love of God, Paul talks about this in Colossians 3. Look at what happens. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Just flip it over a couple pages. Listen to what he says here. This is what being rooted and grounded in the love of God looks like. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, 
humility, gentleness, and patience. Those sound like fruit of the Spirit right there. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together. If we're going to ask for the fullness of God and this prayer of infilling to, to change us, then guess what that does by default? You, you, hang on. This means that there is then no more room for, I can never forgive them. It's gone. That cannot coexist with the fullness of God. They are incompatible. They are oil and water. So if I'm asking for the fullness of God to, to, and this residency to change place and a solid foundation being rooted and grounded in love, then that is going to change your perspective about people of all persuasions. Rooted and grounded. And being rooted and grounded, if we will allow that to happen in our lives and let that solid foundation be built, guess what it prevents? It prevents what I call spiritual blowover. Spiritual blowover occurs when I am still wrapped up in dissension and discord and unforgiveness and jealousy and resentment and bitterness and blah, 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 you name it. I will be blown over if I'm not rooted and grounded and established in the love of God. Guys, this really ties into last week's message, does it not, about generosity? Paul, in his prayer of infilling, is, is driving home for us what it means to think generously as we are rooted and grounded in the love of God. Somebody either has hurt you, or is currently hurting you, or will hurt you. Being filled with all of the fullness, all the full measure of God's love and presence in our lives will protect you from being blown over by that. Because why? He reorients your heart to where you say, Lord, I am not going to allow this to affect my attitude and my heart toward the people that you have called me to love, even though they may not be loving me right now. So that infilling prayer brings a solid foundation. It also brings this, a comprehension of God's love. Uh, end of verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. This love is discovered in community. So Jesus said to his disciples, the way the world will know that what I say is true, that this kingdom of God that I'm preaching to you is true, and that I am the son of God is by how you love each other. How we love each other. So um, you, I'm going to give you permission right now Maybe some of you have already been doing it. You're like, when is he done? You've been looking around the room, right? Look around the room right now. Just look around. Look around at everybody, okay? There's all different um, shapes and sizes and colors and looks and backgrounds and experiences and just, it, we are a, just a hodgepodge of humanity in here, okay? It's, it's, like a, it's like a sandbox full of just some toys that just don't go together, but they just get left in the sandbox, right? That's kind of us. Here we are. And, and we, got, we got stuff, and some of our parts are broken, and, and some of things aren't quite connected like me. I'm just, some stuff's not connected. And we're all here, and God says, guess what? <laughs> this is the place that you get to practice love. This. This. And we get to comprehend the vastness and the perfection of the love of God in this environment, this place. Now, here's, here's where the, um, the, 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 the proverbial rubber hits the road. We 
each of us, I bet if I asked every single one of you, you could at least name one person, one person that doesn't currently go to this church or may not go to any church that you pray for that they would accept Christ. Amen? So, I bet there's one person in each of our minds about that. Now, here's where the reality of all this really hits. We pray for them. We want them to come to church. We want to love on them. We want to show them Jesus. We want to serve them. We just want to, we just want to lavish all this stuff. And God says, that's awesome. I love that. Practice it right here. Because there, there is no way, if we cannot comprehend the manifold love of God in this environment, right here, in this sandbox, that it's going to have any connection out there. So, so, so. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> this is a season of our lives right now. Um, you know, I have seen about as many memes as there could be about this year, 2020. I mean, 2020 has been one for the record books, has it not? I mean, it's so funny. And I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about COVID. I'm not talking about that we have, um, you know, elections and all this coming up. I'm talking about how we speak to each other. All of a sudden, we get real opinionated about something, and maybe we post it on Facebook. Maybe we make some casual comment about it, and all of a sudden, zoo, there goes a zinger. What? We are the body of Christ, called in community to practice the manifold love of God. Let's practice it in community. Let's practice it with each other and how we treat each other, how we see each other. Scripture also teaches that this, this, this love of God has measurables to it. I love measurables. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm kind of a guy who I, I like to track you know, goals, right? And it's not just goals. It's the strategies that, that make up the goals and then the steps that make up the strategies. I'm a, I'm a reverse engineer. So if somebody says to me, hey, Chris, um, not that this has ever happened, but it could. If somebody said to me, Chris, I would like to grow my church to 500 people. I say, okay, you want to grow your church to 500 people. How many people in your church right now? Uh, about 150. Okay, great. So I take that goal of 500 and I just work it backwards to, to where I know today this is what I've got to do to get to that goal. Because I don't know about you guys, if I've set a goal in my life, whether it's a, a church growth goal, a fitness goal, a, a diet goal, a, a financial goal, some kind of goal, if I think about that goal all the time, I won't take one single step toward it. Because it's so big, it's so massive, how do I get there? I don't know. But if I break that thing down all the way to here, I can say, today, I do these three things, that'll get me there. And then what, tomorrow, I'm going to do those same three things again, and then the next day, those same three things. And pretty much, the accumulation of all those same three things, you hit the goal. It's the same thing that happens here with these measurables of God's love. So what does Paul say? Well, let's look. He says here in verse 18, that we may have power together with all the saints, that's all of us, to grasp how wide, there's a measurable, and how long, there's another measurable, and how high and how deep is the love of God. So Paul gets right into it. How wide, I mean, if Paul's going to say that we would understand the width of God's love, well, what does that mean? It is wide enough to not only cover your sin, but the sin of the entire world. That is a massive superhighway of grace. That is a multi-lane highway of the width of the love of God. It, it captures all of the world's sins, and while Christ was hanging on the cross, he was thinking about you and you and all the people right in front of him in that moment, and all of the eons of people that would be born from that moment his grace, his love is wide enough for you. Amen. Man. If that doesn't just make your socks roll up and down right there, I don't know what will. He also talks about length. How far, how far will Christ's love reach out to you? 
He says in Jeremiah 31.3, God says this, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. No one is too far away from God's love. You might be sitting in this room right now saying, man, I have made an absolute dumpster fire of my life. It is out of control. It stinks. I've made some horrible choices. I had my shot wrong. You still get a shot. His love will reach to you. Not only will it reach to you, his arms and hands will come around you and draw you to himself. That's how long is the length of God's love. Depth. Paul talks about depth. Well, how deep does the love of God need to go? Well, I know my Savior, when he went to the cross, you know how far he descended in depth? To death. He went to death. He went all, you can't get lower than death. He went to that place to say, your heart is worth it. Your eternity is worth it. So the depth of God's love went all the way to the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And here's the one I really love. Height. How high does the love of Jesus lift you and I? It raises us right up to heaven. We are given the gift of eternal life in heaven. <laughs> There's been a few days in this weird year that I'm like, come Lord Jesus like now would be great. I just, this, <laughs> go, come on. Sound the trumpet. It's time. I can't wait for heaven. I can't, I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited about, about just so many of the things that the Bible says that we won't get anymore. That's one of the disadvantages, I guess, of going to heaven. You won't get sick anymore. You won't get disease anymore. You won't get sad anymore. Man, oh man, the height is all the way to heaven. Which leads us to this last point about what the prayer of infilling brings. It brings assurance of the truth. Assurance of the truth of God. This is not about speculation. This isn't wishful thinking. This isn't just a feelings-based belief system. Could you imagine if our faith was built on how we feel? <laughs> this. Some of you might be thinking, well, that is my Christian life pastor. That's exact. It's a, it's a big old rocky wave, man. Our faith in Christ is not predicated upon how we feel, nor, nor listen, because the word that Paul uses here in the Greek, nor is it based on some outside experience that I have to see with my eyes, I have to hear it with my ears, I have to feel it with my hands, I have to taste it, smell it. It is not predicated on that alone. It is a deep assurance that God gives you in your heart. And for those of you that know it, you know it. Some of you are thinking, okay, I haven't experienced that. Let me, let me give you an analogy. This, I don't know, this might apply to some people, not to others. There is a distinct difference when somebody sits in a car that has a big block Chevy versus some Ford thing. <laughs> You're going to know it. You will know it. That deep, it's that deep inner assurance of like, I'm in a Chevy. <laughs> I'm just a, I'm a hurt Ford guy, okay? That's just, that's just me working out my grief right now, all right? <laughs> Paul says this in verse uh, 19. I'm going to back up to 18. He says, where you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That's that word, no. It's beyond just the physical senses. It's beyond the, my feelings. It's beyond my emotions. It's an inner sense that God bears witness in my spirit. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled, filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. This fullness of God can be known Known, as sure as life itself, you know that the love of God has drawn me in. 
I want to close with Ephesians chapter 5. Go to Ephesians 5, verse 15. This is kind of a continuation of this prayer. Verse 15 of Ephesians 5. Paul says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Maybe your Bible says drunkenness. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always be giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, you could look at that passage of Scripture and go, whew, I feel so much better. I could keep drinking alcohol as long as I don't get drunk. That thought pattern exists. We're really good as people um, trying to, you know, just live life to say to ourselves, well, <clears throat> as long as I don't go too far, I'm fine. Whether it's alcohol or anything else in our life. As long as I, you know, I know, I know my limits. That's not what the passage is teaching. The passage is teaching us this. What would you rather be filled with? Exhibit A, which is whatever it is that we're currently filling our lives with, or fullness of the presence of God. Sometimes our exhibit A of what we, maybe it is alcohol. Maybe you've never gotten drunk, but you love alcohol. Maybe it's some other vice. Maybe it's an opinion you hold. Maybe it's a judgment that you have just embraced and you apply it in every single circumstance. Maybe that's what exhibit A is. I'm asking you, what do you want to be filled with? I was talking to some people on the praise team this morning earlier about how we go. When we experience stress or pressure in our life, that's when it's revealed about what we're filled with. That's when it comes out. We're like, we can even be, you know, if you want to quantify it, like I could be like 80% full of God. That's pretty good. That's yeah, 80%. And the other 20 is just other things, but man, I'm 80. I'm 80 on Jesus. Maybe even 82. I'm up there. But when the pressure's on and the attacks come and the doubt starts to happen and the fear comes over you, we go back to that other thing, that exhibit A in our lives. That's what we go to, to to get us through. And God is saying, I want you completely filled with me, and I'm willing to give it to you. He says that to us. It's in his word. The prayer of Paul is that we would be filled with all of the measure of the fullness of God. So the question simply is, what do you want to be filled with? What would that fullness of God do in your life? I'd like us to pray. <clears throat> Lord, Lord, we love you. We, we just want to tell you right here, right now, that we do love you. But God, we read a passage of scripture like this and, and it starts to work on us in a way that we begin, to, we begin to ask, Lord, do I have your fullness? Am I filled up with your presence? Lord, we sang a song earlier that just talked about how overwhelmed we are with your presence, that it just... It just flows out of us. God, is that really where we're at? Lord, could, could our existence, could our walk with you transcend more than just a, a couple of verses in a, in a chorus? God, could our lives be actually so overwhelmed with your presence 
that God, we, all we can do is live for you. Lord, that's what you're calling us to. This is the prayer of infilling. And I would ask, Lord, that we would just, in, this, in these moments, as we worship together, as we pray, that God, our hearts and our minds would be open to what you want to do inside of us. Just the, the ownership change, maybe. Maybe that's the step we need to take. Maybe it's relying on the solid foundation of the love of God. Maybe it's learning to practice love here in this community. Maybe some of us lack the assurance. We just lack the assurance. We don't really know. God, whatever it is, wherever we're at, I pray that your spirit would speak directly to all of us. And that we would respond in faith. Love you, Lord Jesus. We trust you because you are good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and uh, let's just worship. What's he saying? What's he saying in your heart? And just respond, just respond. Spoon. 
his name Jesus oh Jesus just call out to him he longs to hear his children call his name oh Jesus Jesus oh, we love you Lord we love you Lord we praise your name strength of our life. truth that is contained in God's word has been offered to you. And God's word says that when his word goes forward, it will not return empty. 
God has planted seeds in our hearts today. Pour some water on that seed. Take care of that seed. And allow the fullness and the glory and all that is our God to begin to move into your life. I pray blessing upon you. I pray for a holy favor to be upon you. And I pray that the peace, the everlasting peace of God, which guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, would be given to you. God bless you. Go in the name and peace of our God. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Amen. Amen.